as, as Devin will tell you, as Chesapeake will tell you, as all the, the gas companies say, like, we're not going to let that methane escape into the air. We're not doing our, I mean, we're not doing our job. We want to keep that methane in our pipes, not let it go out. Devon has special programs to recapture that. So that might happen in, in uh, you know, maybe an isolated uh, case of uh, an independent driller who then can be denied a drilling permit. Control of drilling permits can, I mean, if you can't drill a well properly, you should never get a drilling permit. If you can't handle, if you can't handle the, the truth of the natural gas, if you can't handle controlling that, then yes, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be allowing that thing to escape. But then you're not being a good business person if you're allowing this. And that would be their point, and that's part of what uh, Aubrey's uh, response to, and a, a number of other scientists' have response was to to those uh, studies. So, so much of energy comes with a political agenda. People want to put this down, put that down in order to advance their own particular causes. But if you take anything away from this, it's like as good as solar and wind and geothermal are, they cannot at any time within the next few decades be able to handle our energy consumption. And so as long as we continue to do nothing, we will be slaves to foreign oil of one kind or another. And if you look, look how you, how did you feel about the, the gas prices, right? When the gas raising, 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 raising. Okay, now it's come back down. But who knows, next week something could happen. Mideast flares up, it's gonna climb, 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 climb. And we're left at the mercy of events we have no control over. For exactly the reasons that were raised in the film, on two or three occasions, you might even, on a second cut or something, add it because this has been going on for decades. The difference mm -hmm. now primarily is being able to do, do multiple things from a single site, mm -hmm. but fracking is six decades old. And uh, in the book, which I helped with some of the research mm -hmm. on for Robert, uh, the book doesn't deal a lot with fracking. It's really about this whole mm -hmm. uh, philosophy of a possible transition. Well, uh, but I think that's that very time. helpful. Yeah. I think it's very helpful that you made that adjustment in the course of producing. Yeah, fracking wasn't an issue when he wrote the book. Right. And it has come out in the last uh, year, year and a half, that it's started to become an issue. When did you right. guys close? Last winter? Just six, seven months ago? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then also, it's, it's um, uh, Robert didn't want us to have this in uh, to, to diffuse the focus, but it, it's, the fracturing has also opened up shale oil. I mean, we've gone from zero barrels to 300 million barrels a day. And that has this huge boom then in, the, in the, some of the states in the northern, uh, north, north central part. Did you all look into at all uh, uh, the M85, the, meth the methanol, the, it's a liquid form of, of natural gas that is able to be used on a flex fuel with only a hundred dollar fix on the at the manufacturer level, uh, and you can be able to run vehicles on on uh, methanol as well as regular gasoline either way, and that may be part of the solution. Uh, and you really didn't deal in the film with that very much, uh, but that may be part of the key to getting uh, uh, natural gas in automobiles. Yes, but correct me if I'm wrong. You, if using that methanol, uh, just like the LNG is also used, but that would require you having a hybrid vehicle, would it not? No, it does not. Well, all it requires I mean, is that about hundred dollar fix in terms of, of, you know, you've got race cars that run on methanol, and <clears throat> all it requires is the uh, some of the of the metal to be replaced by uh, uh, plastic at the manufacturer level, and it can run on both. Oh, oh okay. I, I mean, I, I... Flex Fuel Act. That it's a, yeah, have. but it, see, if it's a flex fuel vehicle, you have to have a new car. The advantage of, say, natural gas right now is we can go into any car in America. You and, can also, for maybe a three or four hundred dollar oh. fix, change any car. And it well, costs a lot cheaper at the manufacturer okay. level. Okay. Do you think there's any chance that if Obama is reelected, that this next time he'll listen to Walter's 
and Hefner, both of whom supported him. He did not follow their advice, and if I look back, I'm not a big fan of Obama, and yet, if I look back at the last two and a half years, if he'd been going this direction, the economy would be different, it, the incentives, uh, instead of having $500 billion losses, incentive programs would have produced some results, uh, 500 million I mean in the case of Solyndra. So uh, that's an interesting political and policy question because he flirted with all of this and that's why he had support from people that are very different politically than your general oil and gas folks and then he just dropped the ball. Aubrey, if anything he's Aubrey hostile. Said he voted for him too. Who? Aubrey McClendon said he voted for Obama. For Obama? Yeah, but then if he, anything he's hostile. He, but it still gets back to that issue of your your uh, political influence in your decision-making processes. A lot of his bundlers were tied to these solar companies. Cylinder was just the tip of the iceberg. There's maybe as much as a trillion dollars that went to different solar companies. This, this just in the last 10 days, the uh, this electric car, the Fister, whatever, it around to, to, it will cost around 200000 that that Consumer Reports got one to test it and it broke down during the test. That's two hundred million dollars there, and then they, they may be getting out of the car business. So it's it's a function of you, you know. People help get you elected by bundling funds. You then help them, and you say it's part of a green energy policy. But unfortunately, none of this, none of those green energies just can shoulder the weight of the energy consumption that we require that the world requires. I think they're very important, but they're smaller scale than has been mm -hmm. uh, hoped for. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I think Robert would be the first one to say we need to be pushing on all those fronts, but we need to be getting very practical about how on earth do we get off of foreign oil now so we're not, another decade goes by and we find ourselves in the same <laughs> position there. Uh, is the uh, distribution and marketing plan for, I thought it was well, thank you. That will be able to resolve uh, some uh, conflicts in the public's mind. <coughs> well, that was our hope to try to explain this whole issue for you. And we have, uh, if we printed it out, we have a footnote document that's like about uh, that Janet <laughs> Buster Hart prepared. Uh, where we've got all the facts that we use backed up from multiple sources, so we're not telling you anything that's not true in here. Uh, it's going to be shown on OETA here come in August, and then we'll see where else we could possibly. But for, for PBS, national PBS, they've already said we can't possibly pass it on to national PBS because it's, it's not uh, politically um, uh, possible. You know? yeah. I think that ties well into I had the opportunity this year to see some <coughs> other energy documentaries, uh -huh. um, and I noticed in this one it, it did strike me as a bit more pro-natural gas, a little bit more combative, a little bit more anti, as opposed to objective, it seemed like there was a bit of a message trying to push natural gas as being the primary and, and diminish some of the other sources. What, what, why did you choose to sort of go with that a little bit more? Well, this is based on his book. All right. So this is okay. So this is based on his book. So he's this is his lifetime, but he's in many ways an energy philosopher. Then we did this research. I mean, there's nothing in here that we say about coal and biofuels and nuclear power that's not true. We have a great thing, great bit. We had to, <clears throat> they made us take this out from uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, who is a wonderful uh, environmentalist attorney. He says, according to the, this is the excerpt we had from him, said, according to the uh, National Academy of Sciences, every freshwater fish in this country has some dangerous levels of mercury poisoning in it. He himself has 10 times what's normal because he fishes, he has ponds on his property and fishes. A man can get by with 10 times the mercury level, but a woman can't. If a woman has just the levels of mercury in her that Robert F. Kennedy does that puts her unborn child at risk for a whole host of developmental diseases. And this is not just that's not just true for our country, it's true for fish that's coming out of the ocean. It's true for this whole planet from the mercury that's raining down from all those coal-bring plants that are running all over the earth right now. 
and, and the figures that we quote for biofuels, tiny, very, very conservative. I mean, you can Google this and find out about land grads. That's occurring all over the world. So, you know, if you go to algae, perhaps, and you find a space that will not dispossess people of their, of their homes and their property, but these are big issues in them. Nuclear power, it's like, we just had two plants for the first time in all these decades got approved to be built in Arkansas. But after you see, you know, the, the half-life of plutonium being 24,000 years, they're not going to be able to touch those buildings in Fukushima for decades. Uh, we still don't have the electronics that can stand up to that kind of radiation. It'll be men again, just like you saw up there. Those were the lead aprons, 45 seconds and then that's it, or you're dead. So the, the, if something goes wrong, you have tremendous disasters. We're still, after all these years, not equipped to deal with. And then on top of that, you added, we still, after all that money and time, don't know how to get rid of our uh, spent fuel rods, which were a culprit at Fukushima. So, you know, it's, there's, there's definitely issues with those. And it's like, we're just telling you these are the issues with these other fuel sources. You had a tremendous amount of information in this film, and I thought you structured it really, really well. I noticed you're, you're a writer on it, obviously, but, but how did that work? You had so many different sound bites, you had so many different sources, and yet you were also writing, probably, I guess, for the astronaut, probably for some of the other people in the film, and then some of the narration, too. How did you get that all together and figure out the, the structure and the order? In it? Well, well that's, a, that's a really great question, Clifton, because, yes, we, in order to get this approved and going, we had to have a script. But what happened is we went through, the, as we started to do our interviews, we would, if somebody said something and we had them on camera, we'd take them in place of the voiceover, and then we'd start having to restructure from there because we'd say, oh, well, they put that so well, so forget the voiceover. So, well, did you have the script first? How much of the script oh, yes. Then, and yes. how much of the script then changed when you got, like you got, you got a sound button, you went, oh my God, we need to add that. You yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was happening all along through here, yeah. Or we would find, ah, this would be great, so we'll put this in here. Oh, forget the voiceover, we'll replace it with this. Oh, we've got to expand this. I think in an original version of the thing, we didn't even really get into fracking that much, and then the whole thing hit and exploded, so then we, we had to get involved. In despite, the, despite the depression in the uh, nat gas prices right mm -hmm. now, if you get to do a sequel or even an echo of 30 minutes mm -hmm. or something, you could devote time to the degree to which Oklahoma's position as one of the top three in the last mm -hmm. nine months or so in manufacturing growth, mm -hmm. manufacturing job growth, and it's part of it is being driven by conversion to using nat gas on the uh, assembly lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing what it can do. It's amazing going out to Elk City to see what it does for your, your, your young people, for the high schools, for the colleges. So you don't have to tax the people in the town, the production tax takes care of their schools. Cassandra, you had a question? Was the project born out of your approaching Mr. Kepner, or did he come to you guys and say, hey, you know, you need to do a film on my book? Well, this is a lifelong best friend of Robert Hefner. You want to explain how you... Yeah, I read his book, and I said, that would make a good movie. You want to do it? He said, yeah. That's how, that's how easy it was. Well, yeah, but we had to convince him we could do it, so we had the Kerr film that we wanted him before to, to um, convince him we could, we could handle this. However, he maintained the last cut um, <laughs> privileges on me, so. You really shared narration with the other gentleman. He did it so well. I mean, you didn't even train someone to be... He's like a movie star, isn't he? Yes! I'm so impressed with the sheer narration. It worked beautifully. Yeah, his mom was a movie star in Hollywood. For what Roberts was. The, um, there's a very strong capitalist uh, free enterprise you know, mm -hmm. theme that runs throughout. Um, in sort of a subsidies are bad. Do you think most of the uh, owners of the companies would be into the state and federal government getting rid of all the subsidies for oil and gas? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's a company thing. I can't. Uh, 
because they're always out. But he, here's his point. It says, he made this point about the, it's in the, like a special feature on the number one Greenwell. The only reason that that happened was because people got together. They said, we're going to do this. All the government authorities thought it was impossible. There's no, and they said, you're wrong. We're going to show you. They got that technology together for deep drilling. And it's their desire to go after this that made all the technology develop all that. And oddly enough, Kerr's, one, his, one of his big projects of his life was the Arkansas River Navigation System. The first load of stuff to come up the Arkansas River Navigation System were those pipes for Hefner's number one green well. So his point would be just let entrepreneurs go out and invent the technology and, and, and develop the science so we go after this and then we'll be able to do the things the government can't and shouldn't be doing because having studied all this of 40 years of government intervention they're, they're so wrong so much of the time because they're, they're just you know whether it's you know they want to believe the oil companies because of what they say so they want to or they uh, or here's here's part of why they believe there was a shortage of natural gas if you can believe it back in the early 70s there was there was a shortage of natural gas back east so severe they had to shut down schools and businesses and people were just freaking out but why was there a natural gas shortage it's because the federal government came in and said all right you can sell it within your state for whatever you want as soon as you try to sell it over the state border we're going to tell you what you can sell it for and they said well why are we going to sell it at a loss to New Jersey or New York, we'll, we'll just sell it out here. That's what created the shortage. It was a federal law. Just like what created the, the bust out here in Oklahoma was that federal law. They've been very, very bad actors in energy policy and law for a long time. This is such a great film. How can we help in getting it more nationally uh, circulated. Uh, HBO, you'd think if... Oh, oh, they won't. They'll <laughs> never touch this in two million years. They will never touch this because it's not according to their political outlook on, on, on things. Um, and for the same reason that PBS nationally won't won't touch it. And so look, we welcome any, any, any ideas that you have. There is a website to get... Uh, you can go to um, so we'll, DVDs. You can send them to friends. Yeah, they yeah. won't. They won't have. There'll be some issues with the music and effects that we fix with this thing. But maybe uh, we can start a letter writing campaign from Oklahoma. Well, yeah, anything because the whole idea is the more people that get talking, say, well, let's 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 get involved and do something, the better off. Because if we think we can sit back and just trust government who are in bed with all the bundlers and all the lobbyists and all these people that have, this is why we're in this mess that we're in in terms of our energy policy. I mean, it just seems like if we could take 300 to 500 billion dollars every single year and just put it into our country, our schools, our people, you see homeless people on the streets to just lift up the way of life to deal with our country and make this really obvious, is, think of the prosperity that can come from that and, and the help that we, we could really use right now in terms of our economy. It just seems like, so why aren't we going after this? And the other thing to just remember is those people that say, well, let's have everything. Well, at least now you know there are costs with other things. There are big costs with coal. There are big, scary costs with nuclear power. And there are big costs with biofuels that, yeah, you'll see it in your rising food prices, but it affects other countries over the world that you'll never get to see those people who are impacted by it. By what's going on here so China's really hurting because of the devotion of so many of the government resources to solar mm -hmm. and solar is going to have a niche there's no doubt about it but they mm -hmm. they went a bridge too far and couldn't sustain it exactly. so now they have huge job cuts yeah 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 it's it's just it's just about getting practical about okay we want to advance solar that would be a great thing and to develop those things to develop the kinds of batteries that really can run electric cars but then we have to get a different way of you know, f fueling the grid, which is to get off of coal and let natural gas get in there. Because, you know, most of your natural gas plants today are, are, are dual turbines. So they got an, a natural gas turbine that produces electricity and produces some heat. They capture the heat off that turbine and they use it to turn another turbine. So you're getting twice the power off of one natural gas turbine. And that white stuff you see going up in the uh, 
shot we had in the natural gas, that's steam, that's water. That's why he's walking past that wall of water. It's just, it's a really clean way, efficient way of producing that electricity. And Oklahoma once led the country in that before the fuel use acts. We were the chain of uh, one of the cheapest, cleanest sources of electricity in this entire country. Um, <laughs> that will be, uh, I suppose, a negotiation of the powers that uh, that be. So, we'll see. Time for one more. Okay. Anything, anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it.